before listening to this sermon, uh, you should ideally read Exodus chapter 7 all the way up to chapter 11. Exodus chapter 7 all the way up to chapter 11. Appreciating that's quite a lot to lead uh, to read. Um, if, you, if you're struggling for time particularly, uh, then you can possibly just read Exodus chapter 7 and then Exodus chapter 10 verses 21 to the end of chapter 11. Now, during lockdown, all of our feet have suffered. Uh, not only have chiropodists been closed, uh, but many people have been out walking. Some people put on new walking boots and came back from the hills with blisters. Some people put on sandals and got calluses where their feet rubbed against the straps. Some people couldn't buy new trainers, and so they got hard feet from walking around barefoot. You know, I can pretty much guarantee that if you took off your socks and shoes right now, there would be at least one area on your feet where your skin had gone hard. What causes this to happen? Well, would it be true to say that the hard surfaces cause the hardening of your skin? Yes, well, that, that is true. Uh, the straps or the stones or the stiffness of hard shoes, these things cause hard skin to form. Would it be true to say that our skin hardened itself to the hard surfaces? Yes, that is, that is true as well. Blisters and calluses are, are the body's way of protecting itself from anything that might t penetrate the body's outer layer. Did the hard surfaces harden our feet? Yes. Did our feet harden themselves? Yes. It's not a contradiction to say that both are equally true. In these chapters of Exodus, uh, we repeatedly read two statements that at first seem to contradict. Six times we read that God hardened his heart Sorry, six times we read that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And three times we read that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. How do we deal with this seeming contradiction? Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Or did Pharaoh harden his own heart? Was Moses, the human author of Exodus, completely stupid, unable to see that he contradicted himself in the space of a few paragraphs? Was Moses writing a book to confuse people by asking us to believe two opposite things? Well, no, neither of these things are true. So why did Moses include both descriptions, knowing that on the surface they appear to contradict? But it wasn't to confuse us, or to puzzle us, or to give Bible commentators a job. Instead, Moses described the same thing from two different angles. From one perspective, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. From another perspective, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Both are equally true, and both are taught us with a very practical purpose in mind. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and this is wonderful. Pharaoh hardens his heart, and this acts as a warning. So first of all, wonderful. Now the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, wonderful. Well, let me explain. Uh, for those of you who do live or have lived with other people, how many times have you found yourself waking up and saying, who used the last strip of toilet paper and didn't replace it? Who left the tap on last night with a plug still in the sink? Who broke the toilet handle and tried to stick it together with chewing gum? Whoever did it, own up. When you live with other people, you are not in control of everything that goes on in the house. When you live with other people, you are often surprised to find things the way they are. You were just one of many residents in the same house. And when you know that you've not caused something to happen, you begin a mission to find out who did. 
Now God, God is sovereign. And what this basically means is this. God rules from his house in heaven alone. God is in control of everything that goes on in the world. Nothing takes God by surprise. We see this in chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Fair, said, then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. God describes everything that is going to happen in chapters 8 to 11 before any of these events took place. Pharaoh's resistance certainly didn't take God by surprise. It's clearly not that God had a plan A, but Pharaoh got in the way, so God had to work with plan B. God describes himself as fully in control of everything that is about to happen. God is sovereign. He has control of everything that goes on in the world. Nothing takes him by surprise. And when you are in a bad place, that is very wonderful news. Why? Why is this wonderful? Well, Israel had been taught by Pharaoh that God was not the only God. Pharaoh acted like a God in what he said happened most of the time. Pharaoh worshipped many gods and he believed these gods had equally as much power and control as the Lord. In Pharaoh's version of heaven, the Lord was just one of many gods who lived in the same house, all sharing the same toilet, all sharing the same throne. One day, Ra, the Egyptian god of the sun, might get up early and sit on the throne first, and on that day Ra would have full control, everything Ra said would take place. But then the next day, Kunum, the Egyptian god of the Nile, might beat Ra to the throne room, and on that day, Kunum would have full control. What he wanted to happen would take place. Exodus 7 to 11 is all about showing us that this is not, the, this ver, that this version of heaven that I've just described is not true. The purpose of each of this, the ten plagues is to show that God is God and no one else. That's why verse 5 of chapter 7 reads like this. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. In turning the Nile to blood, the first plague, God was showing Kunum, the god of the Nile, that he has no power over the river Nile. God was God and no one else. And turning the land to darkness, the ninth plague, God was showing Ra, the sun god, that Ra had no power over the sun. God was God and no one else. God keeps on hardening Pharaoh's heart so that God could prove that he was God and no one else. For the more that Pharaoh resisted God's plans, the more God proved that he was always fulfill his. God always achieves his good purposes, no matter how great the opposition. Why is this relevant? Why is this wonderful? Well, would you really want to wake up tomorrow and find that someone else was on the throne? You know, it's bad enough waking up to find someone has got to the toilet before you and left it in a mess. It would be even worse to wake up tomorrow to find that God had no control over the mess that the world is in. For example, God planned to build his church, but Tim, Te Kim, Tim Keller, 
unfortunately got has got cancer. And both Ravi, Ravi Zacharias and Billy Graham died. Now these great preachers are out of action. God's got to build his church with the likes of you and me. Like that's ever going to work. Is this true? No. God knows the amazing things he wanted to achieve through these three amazing Christian preachers that I've named. And God will still achieve his purposes now that they're gone or are taking a break. You know, God promised his grace would be sufficient, but for ev God promised his grace would be sufficient for every challenge you find yourself in. But unfortunately, God wasn't expecting this to happen. And he wasn't prepared for that eventuality. And at the same time as you panicking about the future, God's panicking too. Is that true? No, nothing in our lives takes God by surprise. He will provide us with the help we need at the time we need it. We might panic when things go pear-shaped, but he does not. You know, God promised that he'd work for the good of all those who love him, in, including in every bad situation. But this latest challenge, oh, it's really testing God. He promised he'd work for good in all situations, but he wasn't expecting things to get this bad. You know, we might not believe in Ra or Kunum, but we so often act as if God is just one of many residents in the same house. We somehow believe that God is always fighting with the forces of good and bad luck, fighting with the forces of evil, fighting with the forces of nature. And sometimes they beat God to the throne room and take him by surprise. Exodus 7 to 11 reminds us that even when every other God in this world does its worst, God is still in control. God is in control of everything, including the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And because this is true, God will always achieve what he wants, no matter how great the opposition. Pharaoh couldn't mess up God's plans. Bad luck can't ruin God's plans. Natural disasters, new diagnosis of, of cancer, sudden change. None of these leave God wondering what to do next. And this means, this means God can achieve his plans despite whatever is going on in the world. God can work for good in every situation. God is prepared for them and can prepare you for them as well. You know, it's facts like these that help me get through bad days, even though my bad days are fairly minimal. It's facts like these that helped me stop worrying about the whole list of other worst things that could happen, if which a percentage possibly will. You know, it's facts that like, like these that can help you keep believing God's promises when random things happen and mess up your plans or your expectations. Facts about God's sovereignty can help give you hope in a messed up world that seems like it's constantly going downhill. Because God is God, he can work good in all the bad. Because God is God, God can rid or get rid of all of that bad stuff one day forever. Just like he put almighty Pharaoh out of the way. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart by God reminds us that God is God, not Pharaoh, not Ra, not bad luck, not random chance. And this is wonderful. So Pharaoh's hardening of his own heart reminds us that some, sometimes people resist the idea of God being God. Pharaoh's hardening of his own heart is a warning for us not to do the same. So that's the second point, warning, warning. Now it would be wrong to think that Pharaoh was merely a passive victim in this hardening process. That's why we read three times that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. We read that in chapter 8 verse 15, chapter 8 verse 32, and chapter 9 verse 34. 
if you've not been able to uh, read all of the passage. Uh, maybe we'll look back at those verses. Though in chapter 5, Pharaoh mockingly said to God, to Moses, sorry. In chapter 5, Mo Pharaoh mockingly says to Moses, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? But by the seventh plague, Moses is confessing, uh, Pharaoh is confessing his disobedience by saying, I have sinned, the Lord is in the right. You know, Pharaoh deliberately keeps on sinning, even when all his best men tell him that God, that God, that it's God that he's opposing. Pharaoh keeps on sinning, even when all his servants tell him to stop. Pharaoh deliberately keeps on sinning, even when everything around him reinforces the truth that God is God. Despite the repeated reminders that he cannot escape God or the consequences of his sin forever, Pharaoh keeps trying to resist. Resist the truth. Resist the consequences. Resist God himself. So, why would Pharaoh, why would we, why would anyone resist God in this way? Well, sin... Uh, the, the word the Bible uses to describe humans going their own way, way in ways that are wrong. Sin is a lot like a journey on the Titanic. We like the journey, but we're not so keen on the sinking bit at the end. Our solution is to get on board and enjoy the Titanic experience for a while, but as soon as we hear the words, Iceberg right ahead! will stop our journey and board the nearest lifeboat. Pharaoh basically did the same. Each time he sinned, he knew that the iceberg was approaching, perhaps frogs or flies or hail. And every, each time, Pharaoh kept on rebelling till the last moment. As soon as Pharaoh heard the reports that the iceberg was on the horizon, he stopped sinning and asked if he could escape in the lifeboat called Forgiveness. Pharaoh thought that he could keep this process up forever, hardening his heart, but then softening, again, softening it again and repenting. And yet, by chapters 10 and 11, Pharaoh's heart had become so hard, he is unable to soften it anymore. In the end, Pharaoh didn't even want to hear the truth. He told Moses never to speak to him again. By the end, Pharaoh said he would never change his mind. By the end, God takes away the opportunity for Pharaoh to repent by announcing the last and final plague. You know, it's dangerous to board the Titanic thinking you'll leave when you hear the words iceberg right ahead. For what happens if the noise of the party drowns out the warning of an iceberg? What happens if you're having so much fun down um, on the Titanic that you cannot pull yourself away? What happens if you leave the party on the Titanic only to find that there are no more lifeboats left? Surely it's even more dangerous to harden your heart against God. So, what does it actually practically look like to harden your heart? What might it look like in 21st century life? Well, I've got three examples. I'm just going to describe them, uh, just based on my uh, own experience of my own uh, sinful heart uh, and my own experience of the world based on what God's word says. So example one of a hardened heart. One day you may hear God's word speak loudly about the need for change in your life. And as you go about your day, you keep hearing these loud words running around your head. But after ignoring these words for a while, you no longer feel as guilty for ignoring them. And the next time you read God's word, the same truths don't have quite the same edge. 
sin doesn't seem so wrong. The consequences seem far off. God's anger doesn't sound so fearful. The same truth that you read before no longer has the same impact on your conscience, making it so much easy to ignore it. Example two of a hardened heart. All sin is enjoyable to some degree, but because we know it's wrong, we often prepare, prefer as Christians to only dip our toes in the waters. A little gossip, a little bit of bitterness towards others, a little lustful thought, a little compromise here and there. And yet, like the person who goes to the Titanic party and promises, promises themselves to leave by 10pm, we find ourselves still at the party after midnight. We, live, we love sin so much, we just can't pull ourselves away. We don't, we're not satisfied with just dipping our feet in the waters. A little gossip grows into a pastime. A little bitterness has consumed us with hate. A little lustful thought has grown to become repeated images in our head or on the internet. A little compromise has become very big. We've now not just got our toes in the water, our whole body is in as well. Example three of a hardened heart. You know God is God, but you'd rather be your own God for a little bit, a little bit longer. You'd rather live a life in, uh, you'd rather live a bit of your life first and then board the lifeboat called forgiveness later on. Next year, you'll start taking God seriously, perhaps in a few years when you've got more time. You'll delay just a little longer and then acknowledge God on your deathbed. And since you feel you are in control of your own destiny, you assume that this is a good idea. But remember, when tomorrow came for Pharaoh, he was less interested, not more interested, in repenting than he was a few days earlier. That's why he should have repented the first time the opportunity arose. And by the time the tenth plague hit, his son was dead. Neither he nor we can avoid the consequences of sin forever. The time to repent is always now. For the non-Christian, this means acknowledging God as God now. Confessing you've lived your life for your own, as your own God. Asking God for forgiveness. Asking for God's help to change. This forgiveness and change is only possible through God's Son, Jesus Christ. And if you don't know much about him already, immediately begin reading the Gospel of John. For in this book of John in the Bible, Jesus repeatedly offered God's forgiveness to the most hard-hearted of individuals. And Jesus repeatedly spoke about something called the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that can help people change. And if you're already a Christian, make sure you take these warnings to heart. As it says in the book of Hebrews, today, that's not tomorrow, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It's amazing to think that the same Israelites who saw Pharaoh harden his own heart then went on to harden their hearts in the desert. And yet, this is not actually so amazing. This heart problem is not just a problem of ungodly Pharaoh. It's a problem of all mankind. God is the only one who is able to deal with this problem and help us change. But at the same time, the Christian is called to action. As it says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 17, You must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, 
they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. We are called to be sensitive to God's word and not harden our hearts against it, letting it speak loudly to us, not being like Pharaoh who put his fingers in his ears, repenting at the first opportunity, not being like Pharaoh who kept putting the idea of repentance off, coming to God for forgiveness and asking for his help to change, unlike Pharaoh who did this too late. Moses knew that we both need, we need both of these warnings. We need, sorry, Moses knew that we need both these wonderful words of encouragement and the words of warning. That's why this sermon has had two very different tones. Firstly, God is God and that is wonderful. His good plans to save and bless his people will always come to fruition. For this reason, we can trust him with our lives every step of the way. God is God. That is why we need the warning of hardening our hearts against him. We should always make the most of the first opportunity to repent and change.